everyone, I'm Jim Longworth and welcome to another edition of Forsyth County Connections. Coming to you this time from the uh, beautiful Government Center in downtown Winston-Salem. I'm so glad you could join us today. We have a lot in store, a lot of great guests, important information coming your way. We'll have a discussion, for example, about infant mortality. We'll find out more about our library system, about a special park where you can do all sorts of fun things. And we'll check in and see what's going on at Smith Reynolds Airport. All that's coming your way. Where we want to start, though, is talking about monkeypox. I want to learn more about it, so we called in an expert on this. Mara Tremble's with us. She's public health nursing supervisor for Forsyth County. Good to see you again. You too, Jim. Nice to be back. How did monkeypox, how did that virus come about? How did it get the name? How long has it been around? Give me some background. Sure. Um, so monkeypox has actually been uh, detected in, like, 1950s. Uh, it was found in a research lab where they were using monkeys as part of their research, and the monkeys actually um, were affected uh, by the virus. So, and the, the thought was it was transmitted from rodents who were at the facility. So, um, and then fast forward a little bit, uh, 1970s into the 80s, it, they were seeing some um, transmission to people, um, but related maybe to the, va the smallpox vaccine being stopped in the 70s. And now we are here in 2022, so we have this new sort of um, presentation of monkeypox as far as how the human to human contact and transmission component. So, yeah, how is uh, the COVID 19 virus different from monkeypox virus? Yeah, we've been in doing COVID for so long. Everybody has that sort of idea of how things are, how things work for COVID, but the difference between COVID and monkeypox is the way it's transmitted. Uh, COVID is airborne, so it's the air that's shared between people. Monkeypox, you have to have close contact, skin-to-skin -skin contact. So you come in contact with the lesion of, of a person who has, um, has a, one of the pox. And um, so that's the biggest difference is just the way it's transmitted. Now, when should someone get tested for monkeypox? Because again, as you said, all we've been hearing about is, you know, the, the COVID this and COVID that. As far as monkeypox is concerned, when, when should somebody get tested? Sure. Yeah, the, um, the difference with this is you can't get tested for monkeypox until you actually have a lesion. Unlike people who had COVID, you could get tested um, very simply by a nasal swab even before symptoms showed up. So you, could, you would know if you were infectious. Right. Now with monkeypox, you have to go through a full, uh, full medical exam. Now what about the monkeypox vaccine? I mean, is there anything new on the horizon with that or what? Yes, there are. Um, so their monkeypox is part of the orthopox, which is the same family that is for smallpox. So the vaccine that was developed for smallpox is what's being used for monkeypox. The original one was um, the one that we got as kids when you had the big, you had the scar. Right. So that's still around, but they came up with a new vaccine called Genios, which is a, a not a live virus, or it's a, a virus that can't be duplicated. And that is what's being used now currently for people that have immune compromised system. So we're, we have a new vaccine, but it's limited to um, people. It's really the only one that can be used for people that um, have a low uh, or, or um, uh, a compromised immune system. Is it effective though, in your opinion? So uh, it's unknown. CDC very clearly says for this monkeypox outbreak 2022 that the effectiveness is not known. Um, they are studying it, but based on the, the use of it, for the smallpox vaccine, they estimate it's 85% in a study. Now, who's eligible to get a monkeypox uh, uh, vaccine? Because, you know, the whole COVID thing we went through, it was in stages. Well, if you're elderly, uh, if you're susceptible to this, if you're high risk, that. What about the monkeypox vaccine? How, how, who, who would be eligible? When would you be eligible? Yeah, similar, similar same steps, very different steps. Um, so it would be first and foremost for a person who has that close contact with somebody who's already been diagnosed with monkeypox. Second, it would be for men who have sex with men who have multiple partners or anonymous partners in the last 90 days. Any male who has sex with men who has an STD in the last 90 days or if they're on PrEP for HIV, so medication so that they don't develop HIV. Final thing, very quickly, can someone have a second COVID booster and a monkeypox vaccine at the same time? They can. There is a little concern for a myocarditis, so if you're a younger male, but they want you to wait a couple weeks be between the doses, but you could. Okay, now is there a particular website or a general website people could go to to learn about uh, health issues in general, but monkeypox too? The, um, right now, the, the state North Carolina, DHHS monkeypox, you put that in, you're gonna get the information local to North Carolina. Right now we have 295 cases identified in North Carolina as August 24th today, and also that of those 200, uh, 265, um, seven of, nine of those cases are here in Forsyth County. 
Okay. Mara, thanks for bringing us up to speed on that. You're welcome, Jim. Thanks right. again. We'll be right back after this. Unlike other health concerns, mental illness is not always easy to see. D E P R. Mental illness doesn't show up on a scale. Bipolar? Sorting out a mental health concern takes professional diagnosis and treatment. Anxiety. I thought so. If you or a loved one has a mental health concern, don't go it alone. For 24-hour free and confidential information and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Learn more at samhsa.gov support. Back now on Forsyth County Connections. Been wanting to get this guest on for a long time. Our schedules didn't quite match up, so I'm glad he's here. Mark Davidson is director of Smith Reynolds Airport. Welcome to the show. Good to Thank see you. you. It's good to be here. Busy man. Uh, first of all, for newcomers to the area, uh, they hear about Smith Reynolds Airport. Just remind everybody where it's located. We're in the northeast ward of uh, Winston-Salem. We're just a few minutes from downtown, so it's really convenient. And the, um, you know, a lot of folks might not know how closely aligned uh, Smith Reynolds Airport is with Forsyth County government administration over the years. There's a relationship there. Now, wh what's the history of that connection between uh, the county government yeah. and the airport? It actually goes back many years, back to 1949. They established the Airport Commission of Forsyth County, and it ran under that type of governance for 70 years until just recently. Um, my staff and I became part of the um, Forsyth County government. We are an airport department, and it, we went from 10 employees to 2,000 employees, so it sort of right. gives you an idea. And at first, I was a little nervous about all the bureaucracy and things like that, but it's actually been great. We have so many more resources. We, you know, we have legal, finance, risk management, human right. resources. So. We're able to operate more efficiently, and I don't have to be, I watch my cash flow, but it, it feels good that we're part of a large organization. Yeah, you've got, a, you've got people watching your back, too, and I, I think, now we didn't rehearse this or anything, but I'm just curious, how would you, again, to a newcomer or somebody, how would you describe what the airport is and, and what kind of traffic you have and who uses it? Yeah, we're a general aviation airport. We keep our certificates. We can handle commercial service, but we don't have regular airline service. We're so close to Greensboro, so we really focus on uh, general aviation, corporate aviation, flight training, maintenance, repair, and overhaul. Uh, you know, we just had the Foresight Tech uh, aviation lab built at the airport. That's and right. So we're training mechanics and uh, uh, for that next level of flight, for the future of flight as well. So we're looking at the new electric vertical takeoffs and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's some exciting stuff going on. Now, you sent me an email one day about something called Aerotropolis, an Aerotropolis study. What is that all about? Yeah, back in 2016, um, it used to be the Chamber of Commerce commissioned a report under Gail Anderson's leadership, and it, they hired a firm, uh, Jack uh, Casarda, and he, ter he coined the term Aerotropolis. And what it is is um, in the 21st century, Communities that are located with, you know, with a strong, thriving airport will do well. Uh, like previous centuries, uh, cities and towns grew when they were near a railroad That's or right. roadway or a waterway. That's right. In the 21st century, it's important to have a, an airport. And so they commissioned the report, and there were several findings in it. And so we've been meeting ever since. We actually had a meeting yesterday with the Aerotropolis Task Force, and there were several recommendations within that report. And they pretty much align into three areas. Infrastructure, which I'm really responsible for, making sure we build enough capital infrastructure to handle. Uh, we have uh, planning. There was a land use planning with Chris Murphy and that group. And then marketing. So we, reply, we rely upon Greater Winston-Salem, Mark Owens over there, uh, to really make everybody recognize it's an economic development engine asset for the community. You mentioned earlier about location in the North Ward. Uh, I heard there's some construction going on, uh, fencing going up around Liberty Street. What, what is that all about? Yeah. Uh, this past summer has been crazy. Uh, in June, we had a couple projects going on at the same time. Um, if you drove by uh, North Liberty Street, uh, right up there, we had a runway that needed re, uh, rehabilitation. And so we actually had to close our primary runway, which is 6,655 feet, for 28 days. Oh, wow. And we did 27,000 tons of asphalt in 28 days. And they were, uh, Sharp Brothers was the contractor. They did a great job. So we had that project going on. And then right next to the road, you might have saw some um, buildings being demolished because we're building two new 20,000 square foot corporate hangars. Wow. We're, all our hangars are 100% full. So we are building for the future. Well, before we lose time here, anything else new on the horizon you might want to tell us about? Yeah, I'm really excited about the terminal. You know, the terminal was built in 1941. It's, it's dated. Uh, 
we are got a big project uh, to rehabilitate the, the terminal as well as build a new maintenance repair and overall hangar for all those students coming out of Forsyth Tech. Right, so right. There's a, about 70 million being invested in the airport over the next couple of years. That's exciting stuff. Now up on screen, I think we're going to have this graphic. SmithReynolds.org is the website people can go to to learn more about uh, the airport and what's going on there. But I appreciate all you do to keep things running out there because it is a very important part of the community, and, and I thank you for that. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, don't be a stranger. Come back sometime. Okay. Won't Sounds you? good. All right. We'll be right back after this. This is what too much sounds like. This is what stress feels like. And this is what help feels like. If you've lost a job, worry about your next meal, or have trouble making it through the day, we can help. Text STRESS to 211211 to find a solution. Back now on the Forsyth County Connections, time to talk about the library. I have fond memories of the Central Library a million years ago when I used to go. But we're here with somebody that knows all about it. Laura Luck is library supervisor for Forsyth County. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Hi, good to be here. Now, how long have you worked uh, in the library system? Uh, for 26 years now, so. So you've seen a lot of changes. Oh, uh, a ton of changes. Yeah, yeah, off camera, she and I were talking about how that we used to have a little different kind of books and record players and film strips back then, but things are, things are changing. First of all, what, what's going on in the library for September? Let's sort of do something topical here. What's going on? Well, we have a lot going on in the library in September. It's one of our busiest months. Um, we do fall programming, and one of our big fall programs is our community read program, which is on the same page, uh, where we encourage the community to read the same book and discuss it. And uh, this year's selection is The Personal Librarian, so one of our favorites, by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. Okay. And what, what age groups people can do that? Actually, we tailor programming so that it will uh, affect all age groups. We'll find children's books that are in similar themes or topics uh, and discuss those as well. But usually the book itself is from high school age up. All right. Now, here, here's a section of the show where you're going to update me and educate me about some things because it's mm -hmm. been a while. Now, who, who's eligible to get a library card? Well, I'm glad you asked because September's also a uh, library card sign-up month. Okay. So we encourage everybody to get a library card. But in September, we particularly focus on our students, which is great. Right. Um, we have a program called Class Access. Um, this is fairly new. We started last year where uh, Forsyth, uh, Winston-Salem and Forsyth County students can use their student ID oh, okay. as a library card. All right, now, you know, I come from a generation where we don't want a lot of hassles. So now, is it difficult to get a, a library card these days? We are trying to make it as painless as possible. <laughs> I think uh, the pandemic, if it taught us anything, was to try to simplify and work with people. So one of the things we did was get uh, online library card registration oh, up good. and running. Good. So if you uh, live, work, or student in Forsyth County, any of that um, property, you live in an adjacent county, we encourage you to either come in and you know bring uh, an ID or uh, something with your address on it, right? And or go online. And will sign I still up. get a physical card that I can you keep? All, yeah, you indeed okay. will. You'll right. get it uh, right. that day or mailed to you if you apply online. Now, what kind of resources can I access and uh, with a with a library card? What are the, as the old fellow said, what are the privileges? What do I get? Um, well, what don't you get? Everybody knows <laughs> the books, like we were discussing books and music and movies, and that's the regular stuff. But we also have. Uh, databases, online resources, research tools, all sorts of things you can do with your library card. Yeah. Um, to talk about a few, um, if that's all right. Yeah. Uh, for example, Udemy. Udemy is an online database that the library has that uh, allows you to take courses online and get certifications for things. Okay. Um, you can improve yourself in business, uh, technology, personal development, all sorts of things like that. That's a great one. Um, our newest one, which is my favorite, 
is Hoopla. Uh, Hoopla is a streaming access database. Okay. So you can get movies and music and comics and TV shows. That's so neat. That's so yeah. neat. And again, a place for all ages and a lot of activities going on there. Now, last thing before time gets away from us, is there a, a website that people can go to to find out more about what's going on and some of the activities and special things during the month? And tell me about that. Uh, definitely. Um, www.forsyth.cc backslash library. Okay. It's fairly easy to remember. You can get to it from the county homepage as well. Okay. Um, once you get there, uh, we have a new website, and so it's been updated, and it has, um, I think, user-friendly format so that you just scroll down a little bit, That's and you'll see like. little buttons that say ebooks and more, or um, online research tools, or the catalog. That's good. I'm going to check it out. Laura, thanks for doing this oh, and bringing you. us up to speed. That's great. Thank Come you. Come back to see you sometime, will you? Definitely. All right. We'll be right back after this. So, I keep hearing how things are getting back to normal. Really? When am I back to normal? What is normal anyway? I can't even remember. Is this normal? Seriously? No. Was this ever normal? Please, I think this used to be normal. Then I figured out, just stop it. So much has changed. No wonder nothing feels normal. But here I am, still standing. A brand new edition of me. This is no time to go back to anything. It's time to go forward and discover the new person I am now. I'm all in. For some great tips on finding your new normal, visit yourlifeyourvoice.org. You look familiar. Back now on Forsyth County Connections, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about a very serious topic, infant mortality. We have an expert in the field who's going to help us through this right now. She's Roberta Hawthorne, Coordinator of Health Services, Coalitions, Community Engagement for Forsyth County's Department of Public Health. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I have a brochure in my hand. I'm going to tell folks how they can get this in just a minute because it's really neat. But first of all, uh, give me a sort of a brief answer of so we can understand what is infant mortality? So infant mortality is a very sad and serious topic because it means babies who pass away before they turn one year old. So these are babies who are born to families here in Forsyth County, but they never make it to their first birthday. Very tragic. And there are all sorts of reasons why we can, you know, there's all sorts of information we can give people to find out that. But there's something you emailed me about the other day, and it was called the Infant Mortality Reduction Coalition. Now, what is that about? That's right. So this is a coalition that's coordinated by the Forsyth County Department of Public Health to bring together community members and resources to help reduce infant mortality in our area. So our members include representatives from our local hospitals, clinics, nonprofits, community groups, and individuals who all collaborate with us on our initiatives. Uh, yeah, how, how, how big a problem is infant mortality in Forsyth County, Roberta? So infant mortality is usually measured as a rate of how many babies die out of every 1,000 live births. So if we look at data from 2020, we know that the overall infant mortality rate in the United States was 5.4. In North Carolina, it was 6.9. Not good. Not good. And in Forsyth County, it was even higher. It was 7.2. All right, now let's circle back to something we were going to get at a minute ago, and that's causes of infant mortality. Now, we could probably take an hour talking about things that cause it and ways to prevent it. But give me a few examples of what causes infant mortality. So like you said, there are many, many factors that contribute to infant mortality. Uh, some of them may not be preventable, but many of them are. So some things could be birth defects, prematurity, but we also have to think about things like unsafe sleep environments for babies or secondhand smoke exposure. So that's really our coalition's work. We try to make sure that the babies and the parents in our community have everything they need to be safe and healthy before, 
during and after pregnancy. A lot of education involved in there and that's a good way of, of trying to work toward prevention. Are there any specific preventative measures maybe that parents can take if they're watching this now, they've just had a baby, uh, any tips that you'd like to, to, to give the parents? Sure, so once baby is here, of course we wanna make sure that the baby has a safe place to sleep. That means a safety approved crib, bassinet, or playpen. We wanna make sure that the baby is always sleeping alone. That means not in bed with the parents or with a sibling. And when you place the baby to sleep, you always wanna place the baby on their back, not on their tummies or their sides. Yeah, you know, uh, it's interesting you bring up the thing about letting the baby sleep alone. I think sometimes we forget that as adults and even as larger siblings, you can roll over on it on an infant and things and even though you want to cuddle with them and, and be close to them so yeah that, that's good advice there now I, I said at the beginning of this segment that I had a, a really neat brochure some very good information how can and you can't really read that from here but trust me this is good information how can uh, folks get this so the best way to get more information is to start out on our coalition's website which is helpourbabies.org there's more information about infant mortality and our coalition's work on that website, as well as information about our upcoming event on September 21st, which is called Walk a Mile to Save Our Babies. How about that? Where is that going to be located? That is going to be hosted by the St. John CME Church here in Winston-Salem, okay. and it will include an awareness walk of one mile around the Kimberly Park area. Uh, and tell me again, the date was September? That is September 21st. Okay. It is free to register and everyone is welcome. Well, I just appreciate all you're doing, Roberta, to keep us educated about this, this very serious topic and let's hope that we can uh, continue on the prevention and lower those numbers. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be right back after this. Every year, 4.5 million young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 visit the ER. It's every parent's nightmare. Umergency gives you all the tools you need to quickly and effectively manage your family's emergency. Umergency provides instant access to vital resources, customized to your student's campus and local community, digital consent form, and built-in urgent alert button. Umergency gives you peace of mind when you need it most. Download your Umergency app now. Back now on uh, Forsyth County Connection. So glad you could stay with us. We have a special guest who's going to tell us all about a special park. I always like to hear about the different parks and recreation areas we have. Ricky Lunsford's with us. He's maintenance manager for Forsyth County Department of Parks and Recreation. Thanks for stopping by. No problem. Uh, let's talk about Kernersville Lake Park. We were sort of communicating by email and what we wanted to talk about. Um, now I'll admit I haven't been out there. So tell me where it's located, how big it is. Give me a couple of specifics on it. You really need to come out and look at it. It's a beautiful park. Um, we have uh, fishing there. Um, we have a nice size playground, uh, volleyball court, horseshoe pits, a couple of asphalt walking paths, a nature trail, and we have a large shelter uh, for bigger groups that accommodate 150 people that's right along the water and has a pretty, really pretty good view. Yeah, I want to find out more about that in a second too, but I'm still curious for people, especially when, if they've just moved in the area, how would they access? I mean, do you go down 66 or I mean how, how do you get to the park? It's um, between Walkertown and um, Kernersville on Old Valley School Road so it would be 66 to Old Valley School Road. All right now you mentioned a lot of things just a minute ago so let's sort of pick those apart. You talked about a shelter now, people are used to, in our day we used to call shelters picnic shelters but there's you know shelters. Mm -hmm. uh, now uh, these things can be used, do, do we have to reserve in advance or, or if a, you know, a group, a church group or somebody wants to use them so people aren't fighting over them? How does that work? Yes, if you call the Parks and Recreations Department, you can reserve that shelter. We do have individual picnic sites as well that do not need to be reserved and it's um, uh, just one picnic table, a grill. Now, is if I have a church group or civic group wants to come out and use a shelter itself, uh, is there a, a fee when I sign up to, to use it? Yes, they do have a fee for, for the shelters, um, and I think it's uh, $75 for uh, a day. Right. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you get it all day. Yeah, well, that's good. And then you can utilize, you said you have some, some uh, playing fields and other area where people can do activities, so if they do a shelter, they can do other things too? Yes, we have the horseshoe pits, the volleyball courts, um, uh, volleyball court, and the uh, playground. 
Now, one thing that you mentioned, I don't want to you know, skip over it because you mentioned you know, being adjacent to sort of a waterway area. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I want to get sort of an uh, idea of you, you do rent boats out there, right? <clears throat> yes, we do rent boats. We have uh, 10 aluminum rowboats that we rent for fishing. And they're uh, $3 for three hours or $6 for six hours. We also have 10 uh, four-seat pedal boats there that we rent for $5 for a half hour or $10 for an hour. I love those old paddle boats. I mean, I think as a, as a kid, my first exposure to them was going out to Tanglewood, and, yeah. and they had some paddle boats. And uh, so I think that's great. Uh, now, let's say I've got a, I'm a fisherman, and, and I've got my own little boat that I want to bring up. Now, are you allowed to bring in your own boat? How do you bring it in? Where do you go into? Is there a specific area? What, what's the deal on that? We don't allow the public to bring their boats in. The lake is really, since we do have 20 boats there, it is kind of tight to put other boats on it. Okay. Now, what type of, for folks that are watching this program, there will be some who are real fishermen. Mm -hmm. And let's say they haven't been there yet. And you mentioned yourself a minute ago, you let the cat out of the bag so there's, you, know, you can fish out there. Mm -hmm. What kind of fish can you go after? We have largemouth bass, channel catfish, uh, carp, uh, brim, and crappie. Okay. <clears throat> and the, uh, the, the catfish are averaging around five pounds each and uh, bass around four pounds each. That's not bad. Now, uh, tell me something about uh, the, the park hours, because I know that people can go to a general county website and work their way through and see about all the different parks. So we have a lot of neat parks in the county. But in, in Kernersville Park specifically, are there certain hours that you can get in and out or what? Yeah, this one's a little di di different than the other parks. Um, it does open March the 1st, <clears throat> and we close the week before Thanksgiving. Okay. And it's closed every Wednesday. And um, we open, depending on what time of the year it is, at 6.30 a.m. or 7, p 7 a.m. Right. And <clears throat> the closing times coincide with the uh, daylight savings and the uh, sunset each day. Okay. Each. So if I tell you I want to come out there and fish at dark, you're going to say, no, I can't do that. It's pretty close to dark. <laughs> we also do uh, uh, provide life jackets, oars, and pedals for the, uh, well, yeah. the people that don't want to bring a trolling That's motor. That's important. That's i got to get out there and do those paddle boats. So, but I tell you, hey, Ricky, thanks for doing this and bringing us up no to problem. speed of what's going on. And uh, as I said, you can go to the general uh, website and find out about parks and recreation. Speaking of that, you know, the one we've had up here the whole time behind us, connectwith.forsythecountync.gov, you can check that out too. And we're here at the end of the program, and I appreciate everybody with, uh, being with us. I also want to give a quick shout out to uh, Tracy Doyle for uh, being behind the scenes, taking care of putting this whole show together. And of course, to County Manager Dudley Watts, who's our executive producer, and helping us uh, with all the great guests on the show. I'm Jim Longworth. We'll see you on the next edition of Side County Connections.